You know, for the last several weeks, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit's role in our life. And uh, today what I'd like to do is talk about the Holy Spirit's prayer life. What is a prayer life? Um, a a prayer, prayer is communicating with God the Father. Um, I know that we think of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as uh, co-equal, all God. But prayer is their communication with each other. We find Jesus praying in the garden. He was always going out, uh, praying over people, praying for people, teaching people how to pray and communicating with the Father. But I don't know if you realize this or not, but very pointedly, the, the Bible talks about how the Holy Spirit's prayer life is all centered around you. I mean, think about that. The purpose of the Holy Spirit is to pray for you. Probably the biggest, the, the, the most significant passage that deals with the Holy Spirit of God's prayer life is in the book of Romans chapter 8. I, 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 I the, 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 the first portion of it all deals with basically the fact that there are times that people, that people hurt. I, uh, I've always tried to teach people that when you're young, you know everything. Have you ever noticed that young people know Everything. That's why they never ask you your opinion. And if you try to give it, they just kind of ignore it and that type of thing. Because when you're young, you know everything. Why is that? You know everything because you've experienced really nothing. You see, you can know everything there is to know until you have a problem. And the first time you have a problem, an issue that you can't fix, you realize that there's something that you don't know. And you say, well, 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 how is that the case? If you have a problem that you can't fix, there's something that you don't know. Because if you knew the answer to the problem to fix of it, guess what you'd do? You'd fix it. My longtime doctor, Dr. Sparks, he was my doctor for 19 years. He, uh, matter of fact, he's rolling over in his grave right now because he, he'd always tell me, he said, Carl, you're nothing but a train wreck. And he said, you know, you, there are no children in here, okay? If you're watching with your children, turn it off right now on Facebook. Dr. Sparks looked at me and he'd go, Carl, you're an idiot. And you're the worst idiot there is. And I said, well, you want to explain to me why I'm an idiot? He said, well, an idiot does the wrong thing. But you're the worst form because you pay me as a doctor to give you advice to tell you how to fix your physical problem. And then you leave here after paying me to tell you how to fix it. And you still don't do what I tell you to do. I'll never forget when I realized that there were some things I don't know. You see, the worse a problem is, not only does a problem define for you there are things that you don't know, but the truth is, the more difficult a problem gets, the more you don't even know what the question is that you need answered. Once you and I have experienced a little bit of life, we realize that, you know, in this world, we're filled with difficulties and trials and tribulations. And sometimes you just, you hurt. I don't know if you realize this or not, but God understood that in this fallen world that you and I would face things that we have no answers to. That there would be hurts and difficulties in life that we just, 
you don't even know what question to ask. The, the eighth chapter of the book of Romans is all about that situation in life. You see, where does this hurt in life come from? It, it, first, it comes from things that cause us to suffer. Notice verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Notice, he says the sufferings that you're, that you're dealing with now are not even compared to the glory that one day is going to be revealed. He says as, as bad as it is right now, the flip side of that is going to be even more than your expectation. When we relocated the church a number of years ago, uh, we found out we, we, the church had an old grandfather clock that was outside the sanctuary or outside the, the staff, the pastor's office. And I just love that old clock. And uh, so when they put a price on it, I bought that clock. Matter of fact, that clock is sitting in my house and, and I've got it. I paid cash for it. It's mine. You know, I just didn't tuck it underneath my, my coattail and carry it home. But the clock has a pendulum on it. Six foot tall and the pendulum just swings, you know. All day long, it just swings. And when it gets very much to the next other side, it just swings back to the other side. Imagine verse 18 is a pendulum. Paul said, as difficult as it is in your pain and suffering, that you never imagined that you would get there. I want you to think about the fact that on the other side of the pendulum is even more glory and grace. Everyone in this world is going to go through times of suffering. Everyone that deals with his life is going to go through times of frustration. Just pure frustration. Verse 20, for the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. I don't know if you realize this or not, but there are times that, that we face frustration and sometimes it comes from God. Sometimes it comes because we, we just don't have a clue. You know, you, you, you want to do something and you just, you just can't. I've come to that place in my life now. There's things I want to do, and I just can't. And it just... Argh! And my thought is, you know, if I were younger, I would. And it's frustrating. Do you ever get frustrated? I do. The difficulty comes from suffering. It comes from frustration. It comes from, from bondage and decay. Verse 21, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. He said in this world that you and I are tied to decay. You ever, ever go through a, gro a, a grocery store, the pharmacy area, or go through a pharmacy? How many of the products are designed to stop decay? In my doctor's office on Thursday, and, 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 and now, they're on the front window, Dr. Sparks' office, I mean, you'll see it. They're now offering Botox for $12 a shot. And so I asked the little girl, I said, so it's $12 a shot? Yeah, it's $12 per injection, Botox. I said, well, well, where would I get, where would you put, if you were me, where would you put Botox? I mean, for 12 bucks, you know, hey. I've always heard Botox goes the right thing, where would you, and she looked at me and she said, well, you know, usually Botox is for people that have excess skin. You, knowing you put Botox in, it stops the wrinkles. She said, you have enough substance behind your skin that wrinkles don't have a chance. <laughs> now, is that not the most polite way to say preachers are too fat to have wrinkles, you know? 
The Bible says here that you and I are in bondage to decay. I don't care how much Botox you get, what you pay for it, how much cream you stick on it, how much war paint you cover it up, how much dye you change the color of it. Guess what? The moment you were born, you were chained to a body that's decaying. The hurt comes from suffering, frustration, bondage, and decay. It comes from from physical pain. We, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. When I went through problems with my neck, they, they gave me some pills so that I didn't hurt very bad. And uh, I don't know, y'all probably remember that. You, you probably, what you probably remember is something I said in church just a direct quote, but, but I was taking a pill so that I didn't hurt. And, and uh, Shelly said, now listen now, remember that, that when we go back to church now, you don't take any of those pills before you preach. You ever hurt? It's, a, it's amazing what physical pain does to bring about depression or anxiety. How about this, the season of life? You know, it's now fall, and we're still looking at an average daytime high in the upper 90s. We're being consistent. But used to, when I was a kid, you had seasons. You had summer and winter, and one's cold, one's hot. Paul even said to Timothy, he said, be instant in season and out of season. You know, sometimes things are good. Sometimes things are bad. Notice what he said in verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, we are the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly the adoption of the sonship, the redemption of, of, of our bodies. And sometimes you just got to wait till the time's right. Which brings us to the last one, which I know you all love, waiting. Don't you love to wait? I just love to wait. You know, a couple of years ago, Terry and I were having to drive from Florida, Kentucky, and we only had a day and a half to do it. And we're going up this little two-lane road in Alabama, and there's a truck in front of me, and speed limit's 55, and they're going like, 42. Nothing's around anywhere. Truck with a camper on it. They're going 42 and 55. And I said, Terry, I follow them as far as I'm going to. So I want to tell you what, a guy that doesn't speed, I, I put the foot into the floor. The four barrel kicked in. The truck went, Mwah! and I pulled around real fast because all I had to do is get around this truck with a camper on it. I looked up the road, there's nothing in the world out there, nothing for miles in front of that camper except uh, Alabama Highway Patrolman. <laughs> the camper wasn't going slow because he wanted to go slow. He was going slow because the Alabama State Trooper was going slow in front of him and he knew if he passed him, he was going to be in trouble, but I didn't see it. Matter of fact, I explained that when he put the lights on, I just pulled on around him and he went like that and I pulled over. Sir, do you know how fast you were going? I said, mm. And I'm thinking, wow. Once again, my lack of patience has cost me hundreds first ticket I'd gotten in like 30 years. I just don't speed. What do you do when you go through times like that in your life?
sometimes we get depressed, sometimes we get frustrated, sometimes we get anxious, we're troubled, we get fearful. What's God's answer for all of that? The Holy Spirit. Notice verse 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit of God's purpose in this world is to help you and I when we're weak. We don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Even when you and I don't know the answer to the question, or we don't even know the question we need to ask, the Bible says the Spirit of God is going, God, they're in the middle of it. Sometimes it's not even with words. You know, sometimes when you're going through it, you, you don't need somebody to sit down and tell you what to do. It's just comfortable to know that there's somebody sitting down with you. You ever been there? Not that they have answers, but they're there just to say, you're not alone. I'm with you. You see, if you and I would just stop as a child of God, I believe that God wants you to know that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I am with you. And sometimes the Spirit of God just sits down beside you and just goes, The Spirit's prayer life is to intercede for you. His priority is to help you accomplish God's will. Notice verse 27 and 28. And he searches our hearts. He knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. When the Spirit of God prays for you, he's praying for you that God's will would be done, will be done in your life. Sometimes we just don't know what to do. But our desire to be, God, that your will would be done in my life. Why? Because if God's will is done in my life, I always know that it's going to be good. It's always going to be good. God wants the best for you. He wants the best from you. Sometimes you're not going to agree with it. Sometimes you're not going to want it. But God is never going to not want the best for you. So if we do the will of God, it's always going to be the best. One of my favorite pastors of all time was telling me about the day that he put his mother in a nursing home. He said all our lives we... Uh, Mom, mom equated the nursing home to the, to the poor folks' house. Y'all remember those days? She said, son, I don't care what you do with me, but please don't put me in the poor folks' house. He talks about his, his, his wife quit work so that they could move his mom in with them and he was an evangelist and they just did everything they could to help her, his mom. And one day his wife just said, honey, I, I can't do it anymore. And my friend told me the story. I mean, we're just sitting there drinking a cup of coffee. He said, Carl, the hardest thing I ever did in my life was sit down and tell my mom. said, mom, I'm sorry. We've done all we can. But mom, you got to go in a nursing home. I don't even know, Mom, if you can understand me, but Mom, 
We just can't do it. They found the best one they could. Junior said the day that, that we, we got mom in the van and we took her and we, we had her, her own bed, her own rocking chair, her, her telephone, her TV, and uh, even the candy stash where she gave her great-grandchildren candy they took with her. And they got her settled in the room and he sat down inside the bed with her and said, Mom, Mom, here's your room. Now listen, I need to go fill out some paperwork. I'll be right back. So Junior and his wife went down to the desk, filled out some paperwork, and they walked back into the room. And his mom was laying down. He reached over to kiss her and tell her, Mom, we'll come back. We'll see you tomorrow. We're going to see you every day, Mom. And he said, I realized that when I kissed my mom, that my mom was no longer here. He said that that day, God didn't give us what we wanted. God gave us what we needed. You see, guys, you and I need to understand that when we go through difficult things in life, when we trust God and we put things in the hand of God, there are going to be times that God is not going to give us what we want. But God is always going to give you what you need. That's why that verse says, and we know that all things God works for the good of those who love him. So when you and I are groaning and complaining about what's going on in life and we're going, God, I can't take this anymore. I promise you the Holy Spirit, while you're complaining and groaning, is going... Now, Father, here's what they need. Father, here's what's best. The Holy Spirit is praying, interceding on by our behalf. His priority is God's will. He is he is trying to help us do what? Be patient and focus on God's plan. If there's anything that's been going on in my life in the last year, I can see God saying, okay, now I'm going to teach you to wait on me and be patient. I hate having to be patient. I don't want patience. I don't like patience. I think patience is for other people, not for me. I want to get it done. I want to do it right and I want to move on to the next thing. But do you understand that part of following God's plan requires you and I to be patient? Verse 29, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son of God, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren and sisters. You say, well, Carl, how do you get patience out of there? Well, first, God is patience. For God to foreknow and predestine, that means at some point in time out in the future. That's what patience is. Not now, but not this moment, not next moment, but some point in time out in the future, God is going to demonstrate that he is God in our life. Might not happen now, might not happen tomorrow, but at some point in time, it's going to happen. One of the things that God says is going to happen in your life is that you are going to conform to the image 
of God. God's not going to give you a choice, guys. He's not going to give you a choice. Some of you are like me. God's going to have to use a ball-peen hammer and just start smacking. And when that doesn't, he'll go to a two-pound maul. When that doesn't work, he'll go to a five-pound sledge. If that doesn't work, he'll go 10 pounds. If that doesn't work, he'll get a steamroller. But you are going to conform to the image of God. The question is are you going to, with patient endurance, allow God to work in your life? And the Holy Spirit during this process is going, God, help them be patient. Help them be patient. And last, that we can stand when we walk in God's commitment. Verse 30, those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he justified. Those that he justified, he also glorified. Sitting down talking to one of our older church members, former church members this week. and Said, preacher, do you remember when you went and visited my husband? Yes, ma'am, I remember. Remember when we brought him home and brought in hospice? Preacher, do you remember what you asked him? I said, well, I, I think so. I, I think I remember asking him if he is sure he's going to heaven or not. Do you remember what he, how he responded? And um, she reminded me. She said that, and I remember this funeral. He, um, he said, I know I'm going to heaven. I just don't know if I'm ready to get on the bus right now. There are four words I think are significant in verse 30. Predestined, called, justified, and glorified. Predestined means that that at some point in time, you and I are going to be present with God without sin, with a body without pain and sickness and sorrow. And we're going to, he has predestined us to be with him eternally in heaven. Boy, it's going to be awesome. But there's a couple other words. The first one is that he called you. I think one of the great things about, about, uh, about my mama is uh, my brother and I used to play outside. And when it was time for supper, my mother would go to the back door and yell, Robbie, Dino, supper! Every night. Some of those days, we were as pure as the driven snow. On rare occasions. I remember one time my brother and I were playing football in the living room and my mama had a pot and a plant. The pot was one of those pedestal and, and we were playing football with a wrapped up towel and you'd throw it and we'd tackle each other. And I'm going to tell you, I laid a tackle on my brother and I laid him out across my mother's pedestal potted plant. We didn't have duct tape back then. We just had white tape. And so we we put the plant stand together and we wrapped tape around that dude. And it was one of those plants, you know, that has the long leaves and the stem that goes out and the two or three flowers on top. Well, that middle stem, it just, it just broke over. So I got me a pencil and shoved it down the middle of it through the break. And then I taped it up around it. 
And I don't know how my mother could tell that we had been playing in the living room. Maybe it was the tape around that plant. Boys, were y'all roughhousing in the living room? No, 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 I, we lied through our teeth. Boys, do y'all know what happened to the pot? We had started getting a little bit larger. Tell you how bad we were. My mother got out her hairbrush and she commenced to wait on my rear with that hairbrush. And I turned around and looked at her and I said, I thought I told you not to hit me so hard. Are you done yet? I outwardly, openly defied my mother to her face. I was a big boy, you're not gonna hurt me. You're just a spindly little old woman. Hit me all you want. That night when supper was ready, you know what my mama did? She looked out the back door and said, Robbie, Dino, supper, come on, let's eat. No matter what we did, she still called us for supper. My mother's not a saint. She's a great woman, but she's not God. If she is God, I wouldn't have laughed at her when she hit me with the hairbrush. I'd have been crying, I'm pretty sure. You see, the reason why we looked at that verse after having participated in the Lord's Supper do you understand that no matter how you perform, God still calls? Second word, justified. Justified means that when God sees us, he sees his son. The blood that Jesus shed on the cross, his body was broken for us, all that defiling stuff we've done, all the bad things we've ever done, God has taken that away and we can stand before God pure. He predestined us to be called, justified, and number three, glorified. One of these days, you and I are gonna stand before God in heaven with a body that's not marked by sin, with no sadness, no sorrow, no financial issues, no burdens. And we're going to spend eternity in glory worshiping with God. From step one called to the last step glorified, the Holy Spirit is going, okay, God, here's what they need, directing traffic for the powers that go with God. So while you are sitting there going, what am I going to do? It's not that I don't know the answer to the question. I don't even know what question to ask when you and I are sitting there in our pity parties going, oh God, what am I going to do now? The Spirit of God is going, I can answer that. That's his role in your life. So when you don't know, he knows. When you can't, he can. When you're wondering, God, how are we going to get from here to there? The spirit is going, you know, I've already got this one figured out. I will never forget Junior Hill looking at me saying, Nadino, and listen. There are always going to be times in your life that God doesn't give you what you want. But there will never be a time that God doesn't give you what you need. Do you hear me? There will never be a time that God doesn't give you what you need. God has the ability to see your life through from being called to being glorified in everything in between.
Please stand. We'll pray together. Father God, thank you for your love and your grace. Father, thank you for the day you've given us. Father, I pray that we would trust your Holy Spirit to do his work in our life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As the band leads us in one final song of worship, I'll be hanging out in the back if you'd like to pray or talk with someone.